Hi, everyone, and welcome to week two, where we're going to talk about conditional inference trees and random forests. So remember that the pace this semester starts with categorical data and then moves into like somewhere in the middle and then moves finally into continuous data and vector space modeling. So we're going to get started here by working with an analysis that is well suited to completely categorical data. All right, so in this lecture, what we're going to talk about is categories, a lot about the cognitive concept of categories, category structure, category theories, and then get into the statistics part of the lecture, where we'll talk about how we can take all of that and apply it to um, conditional inference trees. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about categories, because I'm a cognitive psychologist, and I think it's interesting when um, we run these sorts of human language models to think about categories. Now I'm gonna relate this to you are a website designer and you are trying to decide how to organize your drop-down menus on your website. So what is the most logical structure and grouping of items? And that's the kind of business application we're gonna keep in mind when we talk about the more theoretical idea of categories. All right, so what is a category? Well, categories are a group or an organization of related things, right? So in our business example, it could be that you've decided to sell clothing. So most people categorize clothing first by what gender the clothing is for, right? A concept is a member of the category, right? So for women's clothing, it might be dress. And so an example classic in psychology is that animals are a category and some concepts include dirt, dirt, dog, cats, bird, and fish. Okay. Bird is a very famous example and you'll see why as we go along. Now, the interesting thing is the structure of categories, which is also represented well in the brain. So a superordinate category thing is more abstract. So if our category here is dog, the more abstract version of that might be animal. If our category is women's clothing, the more abstract option is just clothing, right? Things that cover your body. And so we can move our, our periscope for periscope, our focus on more or less abstract, depending on whatever is considered the basic level name. Basic level naming holds a very special place in cognitive psychology where it's things that you use generally to name objects. So if you think about it, when you're talking to children, what do you tell them to sit in, right? You tell them to sit in chairs. You don't tell them to sit in the furniture. So furniture tends to be a more abstract level of a category, whereas a basic level name tends to be chair, right? I would actually argue that um, clothing is fairly basic. I don't know what would be more abstract than that. Hmm. Or I would say maybe dress is more basic and clothing is the more abstract. Right, so knowing that, you might be able to build a structural tree for your website, right? So I wanna, you, you wanna look for clothes instead of shoes, right? And then maybe you wanna look for women's clothes and under women's clothes, we're gonna get even more specific and that would be the subordinate category. Subordinate categories are the more specific category members, so like dress, you can go even further than that, right? There are different types of dresses. And so in my example here, the basic level is dog and my sport, more specific category members here, Collie and Beagle, because I owned both of these. Okay. And so we can move this up and down. So I could say that Beagle is a basic level name, although it would be an unusual one. And we could get into special types of Beagles as our subordinate name. And there's a very famous data set called WordNet that actually attempts to achieve this sort of structure. But we know that basic level names are something special in cognition because many people use them. And so it's not like everybody's going around calling chairs different things. Most people agree that these are chairs, right? The superordinate category might be furniture. The subordinate category might be kitchen chair, right? Patio chair, office chair, right? Lazy boy. And so in one of the next lectures, we'll actually talk about chairs uh, and apply the category learning to a different analysis. Now, a couple of theories on how they think these develop that will um, really come back more in a, in a slightly different lecture, um, but can allow us to start to think about how we might structure 
search engine optimization or um, how you organize data on your website. So we'll talk a little bit about ca category formation. Uh, it's based on the way we perceive the world. So while categories are a universal concept, the categories themselves across cultures and languages are not. And as an American, I have a very strong category for sports, <laughs> especially football. But that is a very different category representation than Europeans who think about football, right? So I'm talking about American football and Europeans are talking about soccer. <laughs> so categories depend on our cultural relevance, right? They're not built into us. They are an experience that we learn. And they're usually organized around this idea of cognitive economy. Cognitive economy is this idea that we don't like to think too hard. So our memory is organized to be efficient. It is not perfectly efficient in the least, but it is organized such that we avoid duplication if possible. So these things are all interconnected rather than repeated def like dictionary entries for each one. Now there are a couple of ways that we can learn categories. And so there are four big theories, but I think I've got them listed as five. So we've got feature list theory, probabilistic theories that tie together with feature list theory, what are called the family resemblance models, which is both prototype theory and exemplar theory. And then just to be confusing, there's one called theory theories. So let's talk about those. And these will be very important for another lecture that we'll use. So hang on to these in memory. <clears throat> so feature list theory sometimes should be called checklist theory. And it's this idea that our semantic knowledge, our, mem our meaning, right, our dictionary in our brain is organized around a list, like a checklist of things, right? So going back to my dress example, what makes it a maxi dress, right? So we've got women's clothing, dresses, right? So we're gonna get into the superordinate, sub, sub subordinate categories, and we're gonna pick maxi dress, okay? Well, most people who know things about dresses would say it needs to be long. Maxi dresses tend to be long. Mini dresses tend to be short. Okay, midi is the weird one in the middle. So that's one of the key features that makes up that. It also should be a dress and not pants. All right, so I've got a couple of features here. And so we might come up with a, a set of defining features, things that are essential to the meaning of the word. Okay. So if you ask people what makes a zebra a zebra, they almost always say stripes. It is essential to being a zebra that you have stripes. Okay. And then there are things that are just sort of characteristic about them. So these are things that are usually true of categories members, but not always. And this is where bird becomes a really great example. So for bird, if you ask people what makes a bird a bird, almost everyone says wings, flies, and sometimes sings. And they go, what about penguins? And people go, well, penguins have wings, but they don't really fly. Not really. What about ostriches? So we can already see this concept of fuzzy boundaries where category members, so objects that go into that category, don't all look alike. Okay. And this is where feature checklist theory or feature list theory or sometimes called checklist theory really fails. Is it originally approached this idea of it's black and white. It is either in the category or it's not, and it either meets all the criteria or it doesn't. But practically we are not that black and white. So how did they come up with this? How do they figure this out? Well, it's actually really kind of an interesting task. And so you do something called the sentence verification task in traditional cognitive studies, where you just ask people if the sentence is true or false. So a example might be a dog is an animal. Okay, you'd say true. We could say a maxi dress is long and that would come up with the feature. That one, a uh, dog is an animal is a, is a measure of membership addresses long would be a measure of feature. So what they think happens uh, mentally is that there's this sort of two-stage processing. The first stage is that the feature similarity is computed. Okay, How much do dog and animal match? If there are a lot of overlapping features, we respond very quickly to those sentences. So if you say a dog is an animal and people respond really fast, that implies there's a lot of overlap and those two things are matching. 
when you say true. If you have no overlap, a dog is a tree, right? The sentence response latency is also fast, but that's for false. So quick responses to these questions when it's true implies that it is a category member and it's very similar or it is, it is one of the features. When it's false, it is not a category member or is not a feature. So a dog has pedals would also be very fast to say no. Now, what happens in the middle? And so sometimes you get sentences where people slow down and they think about it for what's considered a long time when it comes to thinking. Like if you think about it for more than a second, that's a long time in cognitive processing. We are very quick thinkers. And so that's where you stop and you consider what is defining, okay? So if you say a penguin is a bird, that is much slower than a robin is a bird because a robin is a very defining member of the bird category. And a penguin is one of those weird ones that yes, technically a bird, but you know, doesn't have all the quite the right features. And so when it takes me longer to respond, that shows us that there are these fuzzy boundaries, these sort of gray areas. And that led to what's called the probabilistic feature model. Now I started this semester by talking about how we are intuitive statisticians. So why wouldn't there be underlying probabilities if not only by frequency? And that was the other thing I said, if you didn't know the answer, the answer is frequency, okay? And so, the idea here is that there are these essential defining features that are very frequent and very salient. Okay, um, thought I had, there it is. So saliency is this idea of it's very potent, it's very visual. So birds having wings is very salient. It's part of your mental image of it. All birds also have hearts, but nobody lists this as a defining feature of birds, although it's pretty necessary. Most dogs have tails or at least in the case of corgis, very cute stubs, right? So dogs have tails is a very salient feature. Okay? So saliency is not all visual. It's also very, like, it's very important to it, um, but generally kind of something that like is very key to the description. And so this identification procedure is based on probability. And so you rank the features by their likelihood and their saliency. And that's how we should actually define this kind of um, procedure that people put things into categories, right? If they have the most highly frequent and salient features, then they're probably in the category. Okay. And so the identification procedure of identifying this thing as a maxi address, right, is based on the, the required, the probable probability of these features. So some issues with this feat, this set of models, these were the, probably the first big like proposed models that a lot of people thought had some weight to them, is this concept of defining features. And so it's, it's pro is it shows us how fuzzy and gray it can be, but it's con is that it's not a very good thing to say, well, it, it depends. <laughs> it doesn't make a very good theory sometimes. So this like, concept of defining features is sort of slippery. It also does not account for the fact that features themselves are correlated. So the category instances are clearly correlated. That's the point, right? So dogs and cats are very similar because they're in this overarching animal category. Right? Um, intercorrelated features is the idea that some features naturally tend to go together more than others. And so if you're talking about technology, you're gonna have a lot of features that are gonna overlap between categories. If you're talking about animals, like human, living, breathing creatures are gonna have a lot of features that overlap between categories. And those two things don't overlap. Okay. And so we're not really capturing the relationship behind, between how frequent these come up together. Instead, we're capturing the probability of them coming up with this category. And then, um, I don't know that I have the best example of this here on this slide, but there is this problem of procedural invariance, okay? And so if you ask people the same question um, phrased in slightly different ways, it should give you the same answer because it's the same question, but anyone who's lived with another human knows this isn't true. Um, 
what what happens is it's phrased different ways you might get different answers sometimes this is part of the gambler's fallacy um there's a whole set of the of of experiments on risk aversion and, and loss aversion um where if you say you know will you take this bet at this amount of money if you're uh half likely to win if you take this bet this amount of money if you're half likely to lose those will give you two different answers even though they're the same question okay. so what i have on here is a robin and bird um yes right but this this sentence is the one that i don't think is quite right so it should say um are some birds robins? Okay, and the answer is also yes, but you might not see exactly the same answer if I had a better example. <laughs> and so we, we find these like weird tricky things about the way it's worded. And then the theory that's like a checklist, that shouldn't happen. So what's better than this idea of checklist theory? You thought it was great. What could be better? Well, I would probably argue that the family resemblance models are what people think is true with a little dash of feature checklist theory. Okay. And family resemblance models are two types. The argument is that it's either prototype theory or exemplar theory, or it's both. So this whole idea of like, is it nature, is it nurture? It's both. Okay. So that's my other thing that if you don't know the answer, it's both. Okay. Frequency and it's both. So a prototype is an abstract image or representation of the best example of the category. And this has been said that, that people do this for large, complex categories. So dog is a very, actually quite large category because there are lots of examples. And so the argument is when you have these categories that have a ton of examples, we kind of average them together and create this mental image that um, is kind of a, a, a best abstract representation of them, right? Exe um, exemplars, on the other hand, are a specific example of a category. And so we think people do this when there are small concrete categories. Okay, so like cell phone, fairly small category, not that too many examples, right? So you're managing probably one or two of them, right? An Apple, Samsung, maybe Google phone, like there's like four to choose from, right? Whereas complex categories like animals, we tend to average. So prototypes are likely a combination of our experienced examples in our world because these are shaped by our world experience, but the, the average of them may not be anything that exists in the real world. Whereas exemplar theory argues that this is a very specific example that you have experienced in the world and it's likely that every category contains this sort of range of instances. So we've got like these little, this little like picture show, if you will, for each category of what examples count. So back to my dress example. If, if I'm trying to take this to, to come up with an idea of how this would help me on my website, right? So I can kind of clearly see that maybe this um, latrine navigation on the website should be in this sort of hierarchical order and I should pick things um, kind of based on their features. I should group them together based on these very important features so people can find what they want, right? So if I'm picking up maxi dresses, they need to be long. And I wanna put a long one in another category, in the short, per short category, right? You might also group things by occasion, right? So we've got work casual t-shirt dresses, right? Or party dresses. Um, now, prototype and exemplar theory might argue that you should, on the page, the homepage for that, have specific examples that best represent your, uh, your um, organizational scheme. Okay. And so they're grouped together under family resemblance models because their arguments are basically the same, except for like, is it an average or is it a specific example? So how do we decide something's in the category or not? Well, unbeknownst to you, you have been doing this for quite some time. So one of the things that you have to do on a CAPTCHA, right, is pick all of the pictures with a light. Oh, like a stoplight in it, or a stop sign, or a motorcycle, or a crosswalk. Okay. 
what you're doing is training an artificial intelligence model. And that is how we think people do it. They see an example, they get some confirmation of whether or not it matches their prototype or their exemplar, and they add it to their, to their system. And so essentially that same concept applies. So I see an example, it either matches or it doesn't. So I have been shopping for dresses lately, which is why this example comes up. And I think about how like the way that we organize women's clothing is so confusing. Um, and so, you know, if I'm looking at, let's say mini, mini dresses, right? I'm trying to find some kind of party dress. And then this website I'm looking at has like slips on it. And if you're, if I've lost you, like a kind of a sheer thing that you'd wear under a dress, I'm like, what? Why am I seeing this? That is like, should be in the bras and underwear section. Why is it in the dress section? I can't, I could wear that out, but everybody would see everything <laughs> that I owned. So why is it in this category? And that's been a very big thing that I, trend that I've seen is that a lot of places will put these kind of slip sort of dresses that they don't mean for them to be on there. This is not a place that sells those kind of, the, like where you're supposed to wear it that way on the dress category. And I'm like, sure, it's short. Sure, it looks like a dress, but it's not meant to be part of the dress, right? So there's weird fuzzy boundaries and that does not match my prototype or my exemplar for mini dress. Right? And if you've lost me, hang on, I'll give you, I'll give you sports examples in another lecture. And so it doesn't fit with what's in my schema. Now schemas are usually treated a little differently, but you'll see this word pop up where a schema is like the representation of a category, but it's often like a category of, of, of things that you do. <laughs> and so I have this, and instead of like animals, there's like a schema of like events, life things. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but that's generally how they're interpreted. So I have a schema for how a football game is supposed to go, right? There should be 11 men on each side, right? A lot of people in the stands cheering, a lot of referees throwing things when they shouldn't, right? Quarters, a lot of yelling, right? So there's, 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 a, there's a schema, a way of organizing that knowledge, okay? And the features, so feature list theory is making a comeback. The features are the fillers for a schema. So if you tell me, Okay. I'm going to switch to restaurants here. If you tell me that we're going to go out to eat. Okay, cool. And I go, well, what kind of restaurant is it? So I know what to wear or what to expect. And if you say, oh, it's fast food. I go, okay, I'm going to keep wearing my eat sleep statistics shirt. And I'm going to expect it to be quick. If you tell me it's fine dining, I'm probably going to change clothes into my mini dress slip thing, maybe. And then I'm going to expect this to take a while it's gonna be more expensive, right? It's gonna have a menu, it's gonna have waiters, it's gonna be a tip in American culture anyway. And so there are these different sort of fillers, right? Because we have a prototype or an exemplar and that maps onto this sort of world knowledge schema, okay? Now, a lot of times when people talk about categories, they mean like very concrete objects and schemas sort of tend to represent like actions and things that you do. It's not on purpose, um, I think you could, lump them either way. Um, so I have a scheme of dogs as well, uh, but it's just kind of, don't forget that things you do are also categories, right? Going out to eat. Um, the way that you cluster restaurants together in your head is also a schema. That's what we see if we do this sentence verification task again, or if you're asked to pick pictures, find all the pictures that represent the stoplight. It is faster for things that match the prototype or your exemplar than not. And you'll see these on these websites that are like, um, this is your personal style quiz, right? And so the way that they build those is they kind of come up with these schemas of these different profiles of what people shop for. And then they represent them as a prototype or an exemplar. And they have you pick through the styles. Okay. And so, you know, if, if we were talking about, you know, cats and dogs, and I showed you a picture of a penguin, um, you're going to be faster for a prototypical member, a robin, than you are a penguin, right? But if we're talking about using this in real life, right, 
um, people are more likely to, to go on to or move towards a category that matches what their expectation is. Now, the last one is the theory theories. And um, I would say that these are more like abstract than others. I'll say the more theoretical, but then that compounds our problem. So theory theories are more abstract. It, the argument is that we, instead of these things being like examples or like features, what we do instead is we just have these like little rules about the world that describe how all these things are related to each other, right? So horses are found on farms. Cows are found on farms. So horses and cows are very similar. And it's sort of like a dictionary. It's sort of, you know, because dictionaries could also be check feature checklists because they're describing things, but it's more like the way that, oops, sorry. It's more like the way that children work. Right? And they're figuring out the rules of the world. And so there is some research that suggests that people um, in totally new areas, you feel them out with theories. So if you're learning data science for the first time, all these terms may be new to you. And so you're using the sort of theory theory <laughs> to, to help you suss it out. And as you learn, it hardens into more of a like prototype and exemplar theory with features underneath. So there are ways that these all sort of fit together, but I would argue that what you're gonna find, if like the practical use of this is to really think about prototypes and exemplars as defined by their features. And so people will, will, will use both of those things to make decisions. So that being said, let's talk a little bit about the, how we might analyze some of this stuff. So a conditional inference tree is a method of regression and classification based on what's called binary recursive partitioning. All right, that's a fancy way of saying splitting the data in, in parts, maybe not half, uh, especially if the data is already categorical. So this analysis works best when all of the data is categorical, but that is not a requirement for the analysis. So the first thing that happens is that it assesses the association of all of your IVs with your DV and picks the one with the biggest effect size, essentially. So this does often capitalize on chance. Then whichever one has the biggest effect size predicting whatever data there is, yes and no. Is this a mini dress? Yes, no, right? It will split that data and then try it again. And so it keeps splitting the data, trying to predict your final category based on your IVs, um, kind of making a decision tree. So these are very similar to decision trees. They're not quite decision trees. I'll show you an example. Of, of why these are better than decision trees in a minute. Okay. Now, if it's continuous data, it will find the spot that splits. And so if you've ever done logistic um, regression where it creates this, uh, the sine curve, it finds the like 50-50 split and splits it in half. Now that's not the median split of the data, it finds where the best prediction split is in the data. Okay. And it'll keep doing those splits until there's nothing left. Now, not there's no variables left. That's one of the problems with decision trees. It will keep doing the splits until there is no association left. So this is based on null hypothesis testing. So it'll stop until, it'll run until there's no more P values left basically. <laughs> and so we'll see that here in a minute. This is considered a tree because we start with a root, right? And build ourselves out to the leaves. Now, some advantages of this analysis is that in comparison to traditional decision trees and other classification procedures, it, <clears throat> in theory, one second, has less biased various variable selection. As a human whose background is in more theoretical academic stuff, oof, this is hard to say because Variable selection 
um, is biased, a little bit by, by mathematical chance. So if two variables are perfectly equal in their prediction, it will pick whichever one to the nth decimal is slightly larger. And that's, all, that's a little problematic. Um, there are ways to account for that issue. Um, but in this sense, it does not automatically pick a variable. It can split the most times. There's no need to prune your tree. It will stop splitting when the things are no longer related, which is good, because that's a problem with decision trees. And it does show you the p-values. Now, as also human trained in traditional statistics, but who has moved, you know, can we get away from them? I don't know that p-values are necessarily the most informative piece of this model, but it is useful to have some sort of way to stop running the analysis so you don't get a bunch of stuff that isn't useful. So we'll use p-values as a way to know when the tree is grown. Okay. Now the last two couple slides here that I wanna cover before we take a short break, just to break these videos up so they're not super long, um, is to talk about permutation. Permutation is how we come up with the p-values. Now, what happens in permutation is you build your analysis. So here's the results from my analysis. I'm gonna take the data and go and scramble it up, right? And then recalculate my analysis. So here's my original analysis, right? And then here's the scramble data and it's a totally different result. That's good because you don't want your data to match a scrambled model. Let me repeat that. Your data, which is you built a model of it to represent the data, right? We say this is this is the model that represents the data and maybe says something about the world. Here's a bunch of scrambled versions of the data, not just like reordered, like take X and Y and shuffle them independently. And I don't want that to represent reality because that implies then that your model is no better than a bunch of garbage data that's been scrambled. So you want this value to be small much in the same reason that we like null hypothesis testing uh, value, p values to be small, right? We want the probability of the data, the model that we've built to be, to come up again when we scramble everything to be low. Because that implies the model best represents the data and the data is not a scrambled mess. Okay. So permutation statistics are kind of cool because they don't really, rely on the null, right? So the, the probability here is the likelihood of getting this model when I scramble the data, as opposed to the likelihood of getting this uh, value or more, depends on which version, what kind of null hypothesis test you're doing, but the, the probability of getting this value if the null is true, that big important part. Here, it's like not conditioned on the null, it's the probability of getting this statistical result or better um, if, if we scramble the data, okay? And we, we don't want that. We want a really low value, <laughs> okay? Now that is different than bootstrapping, okay? Do I have my thing on bootstrapping now? So bootstrapping, remember, which will actually be used in a random forest here in a second. Bootstrapping is when we have a data set and we randomly select from the data set with replacement because we believe that that data set represents the larger world and reality. And we calculate the statistics over and over again based on a random selection from our data set. Okay, and that gives us a good feel for how much variability there is in our, our parameter estimates. Um, so permutations where we take the data and go, blah, 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 okay, we scramble it up. Bootstrapping is where we randomly select from the data, no scrambling, okay, and calculate our statistics. So in permutation, we're calculating the likelihood of getting this model given the scrambling of the data. In bootstrapping, we're calculating, if I take a bunch of random draws of the data, do I get the same statistics? Those are similar in the sense that you're kind of doing random things, but practically very different for their uses. Okay. Now, a random forest is where we um, really get the good part of the analysis or the effect size where it shows the importance of each variable 
averaged over many trees. So this is a lovely analogy, right? Conditional inference tree, because we build a tree, a random forest has many trees. It tells us how useful or important each variable is. That's great. This is akin to the idea of partial invariance in regression testing, if you are familiar with that concept. But essentially, given all the other variables in the model, how much does this one matter? Very useful. Okay. And the nice thing about the random forest is that it will show me if two variables are equally important and which one kind of got just picked first. So it does kind of help me with this, this bias selection due to their mathematical probabilities. Okay. Now, overall, this analysis is very handy when the data is sparse. Okay. The sparsity problem is where you don't have like every combination of every categorical piece that you may have. Um, and so there might be, if you did a multi-way frequency table, there might be a lot of zeros. Okay. And very useful when the data is non-parametric because there are <laughs> way less assumptions, right? No normality assumption, no linearity assumption, just that we can split the variables and the variables are predictive when split. So we're gonna stop here because the next section will cover the actual implementation of the analysis. And we'll look at how to run this in R and Python sort of, and figure out which one we like best.